Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Now, and it's officially this month, 14th year. We started on radio, and then we heard this strange word about 10 or 11 years ago, podcast. And thank God, we intuitively knew enough to make the leap and take Dare to Dream there too. Uh, it was the right move to make, I would say. Nobody knew back then what podcasts were or would become, but it's certainly, there is over 2 million podcasts right now in the world. So I'd say it has become something, something very notable. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards, as well as a Webby Award. And we always rank in the top 50 of all of self-improvement in USA, as well as ranking in other countries. This week has been Belarus, Uruguay and St. Lucia. So we adore all of you who follow the show and understand the mes message out there and are doing your part to create your dreams and really uplift this heaven on earth that we live in. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I teach business owners, coaches, entrepreneurs, and speakers the time-effective action steps to write a highly engaging book. I've also got a company that Fully Done For You takes the author's book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and I guide you how to be interviewed on radio and podcast, the ultimate visibility formula, so you can be interviewed and booked on podcasts and get massive results. I've got a free gift for you. And for those who would like to learn more about being interviewed and what that's like and what to prepare, go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift, my gift to you. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world, highly recommended in every country in the world. Go to drdanehere.com -E and accessconsciousness.com. Well, I'm excited for today's show. It's always nice to have somebody on that I've watched from afar, and then they come into the lap of the show to share with us their brilliance and their wisdom, because today's show is a conversation on how to start asking the right questions so you can make this a breakthrough year. Yummy. My guests say everything is possible when you learn how to ask. My guests today are Mark Victor Hansen and his co-author and wife, Crystal Dwyer Hansen. Mark is well known as the co-author for the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series and brand, setting world records in book sales with over 500 million books sold. Mark is also a sought after keynote speaker and entrepreneurial marketing maven, having spoken to over 6,000 audiences worldwide. Mark is the author of several books and has been a guest on Oprah, CNN, The Today Show, and featured in Time, U.S. News and World Report, USA Today, and The New York Times, and Entrepreneur. For more on Mark, visit markvictorhansen.com. And our other guest, Carol Dwyer Hansen, is an international speaker, researcher, corporate consultant, author, and entrepreneur. Crystal's expertise is in the field of human potential and a transformational life coach and wellness nutrition expert. She's seen people experience profound and lasting transformation. Crystal's research in neuroscience, epigenetics, and quantum physics provides the scientific knowledge she uses to help people use their minds to help move them out of misery and into a fulfilled and happy life. Crystal is a member of the International Coaching Federation. She's a certified clinical hypnotherapist, and she wrote the book, Skinny Life, The Secret to Being Physically, Emotionally, and Spiritually Fit. If you would like more on her, go to crystalvisionlife.com. And with that, I welcome Mark and Crystal to the Dare to Dream show. It's about time. Great to have you. Thanks, so well, nice to be here with you. We've been looking forward to it. Thank you for having us. Yeah, for me as well. First of all, congratulations on your book. I know what it takes to put a book out there and you've done several. So your book right now is Ask. We'll hold this up so they can see this really sumptuous cover. Ask the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. You're on the right show. So well, once we, there, sorry. Go ahead. You were going to say, I didn't mean to interrupt. 
Was there an event that precipitated the premise of this book? Did something happen that said, yeah, our dreams become our destiny when we learn the secret of asking? Was there a secret of asking that you became really aware of that you said, I need to write this, I need to help people? As you just said, we've been blessed to travel to 80 countries, talk to great, wonderful, lovely people that are smart, well-educated, personable, even have a good attitude, but they lack the one thing that gives them everything. God only gave us the ability to ask, and for most people, that's been squished out of them in their childhood, which we'll talk about. But when you learn to ask, the path to your destiny will unfold because you'll find out what your right livelihood is, and then you'll have the fulfillment of your mind, soul, heart, and being. So it was from your audiences that you noticed the importance of needing to ask and ask correctly. But also, Debbie, we we started reflecting on it because of that. We spend like the first hour of our day day in this prayer meditation session. Mm -hmm. So we always reflect on what's happening in life, the people we meet. And what started, you know, it struck us that people that are so overqualified were falling so short of their potential. And we're like, why? How, you know, we've been through a lot of adversity in our own lives individually and together. And we thought we started, you know, asking what was the thing, if we could really help someone, what is that thing that, that allowed us to transcend that adversity, adversity and to keep going, allowed us to overcome the problems and reinvent ourselves into something new. And what it really boiled down to, if we could boil it down to that one thing, it was the ability to ask. Asking is such a powerful tool. And then we determined that there are actually three channels through which we all need to learn to ask to get to our destiny. And those channels are ask yourself, ask others, and ask God. And each of those is equally important, starting, we believe, with the ask yourself part. I want to go back to the morning ritual. (laughs) And I'm sure everybody would like to know when you say you spend an hour every morning, kudos, what a beautiful way to start your day and you're in prayer and meditation. What does that look like specifically? Okay. So let me back it up just one paragraph and say that we're over falling in deep indefatigably love. And we thought I wanted a soulmate, but I didn't know I'd get a twin flame. We can mirror each other's brilliance or brains or wisdom or whatever it is, but we're sitting having this great dinner at at Mother's Market in Costa Mesa. And there's a sweetheart of a a man of the cloth next to us. And he's senior, seriously, 92, he tells us. And he said, do you guys mind if I tell you what'll make us the the only one secret of a happy marriage? Well, I didn't want to talk to him at all. I just wanted to talk to her, but he intruded and and it was perfect. I said, okay, I give up. What is it? And and, because I don't know that one, I guess. He said, well, for 70 years, I'm 92. I've been running Billy Graham uh, relationship seminars, and there's only one thing that works every time. And I said, great. He's asking questions, and that's our business. So I said, okay, what is it, uh, Father? And he said, what it is, is that you've got to pray out loud with your significant other each and every day and every night before you go to sleep. Now, both of us have prayed in church. We prayed in groups, but we hadn't done that, you know, out loud and we started doing that and it it opens up a whole new level of your state of beingness and and because we're in the business of teaching everyone to ask and become what we can now call a master escrow it gives you the directional compass on your life which unfortunately most of us have been forced into a job whether it's being a garbage man or a, a housekeeper or a business person or a school teacher most people have never said what is my right livelihood what is it i'm gonna what is my destiny with a passion and purpose and Obviously, mine has been writing books, and whenever I've gotten off target, I go south. And when I'm on this, I go north. And right now, we're the best seller. Again, like chicken soup, we got lightning in a bottle a second time. But that guy taught us, and, and like even this morning, we're doing, and it said um, in Joshua 1a, that is it, if you ask wisely, I will give you the answer, and, and you'll meet with good success and great prosperity. And I thought, whoa. And so you're hearing even what we did just today. Well, that's very powerful. So you use the book, you use the good book to start you out and find a passage, or do you just ask for something that you individually or both together want to create? Exactly. We do sort of a combination of those things, Debbie. So we use the good book. We use, we have some angel cards. We do Mm -hmm. um, other, we have other special inspirational books. So we kind of pick a, a, you know, a theme and, and then we also, are sure to address what's going on in our lives every day because 
we believe that's how you stay on track is by you know doing that reflection and really what we talk about in the book the ask yourself part is a reflective journey and it I'm all, you know it strikes me all the time how how little time people spend in that reflective journey and it's really the only way we can understand what our life and what's happening in our life and understand the way we want to take our lives forward. And so it's, it's so important to spend that special time. We put on, um, you know, music. We love Stephen Halper and he's actually a friend of ours. We put on his music and we just get in this space where we feel that, you know, oneness with creator. I mean, we're all a part of our creator. We believe. We believe that God isn't somewhere way out there in the sky with a long gray beard. He's <laughs> the only way we can experience God in this lifetime is right here inside of us. And the only way to, to achieve that is to get quiet, go into that peaceful space and hold the space in awareness so that you can, you can ask the questions and you can receive those messages that are there for you. Mm. I love that. And that is very inspiring to me. My beloved and I, when we remember, so I'm being very transparent, when we remember, we do this syncopated breathing. So we'll look into each other's eyes, get very, very close. And when I breathe out, he breathes in. When he breathes out, I breathe in. And something happens. And I can tell you in that moment, I feel like I'm looking at the most beautiful being in the whole world. And I'm so calm and we're so deeply connected and so loving. Um, and so also part of all that is at the same time. So I'm inspired by what you do every morning that I you know, start to adapt, uh, adapt what we're doing so that it becomes an everyday thing. Well, that's where we're at. And, and obviously we're asking questions on a full-time basis to each other about where we're going, what we're doing, how we're gonna get there, how we're gonna source and serve because we're asking, we're teaching, if you're gonna ask questions to get to your dream, first of all, I gotta go back to one other paragraph and that is the subtitle of the book is a bridge from your dream to your destiny. Now we believe, and I know you do because of all the great books you've written, that everyone listening is coded at DNA and RNA, a birth to become something great. Now, I can't tell you what it is, but if they'll do the, remember, we ask yourself, ask others, ask God, mm -hmm. and they go deep in their subconscious and, and superconscious mind and say, God, what's your destiny for me? 400 times, they push back sleep before they go to sleep, and you tell your sweetie kids, hey, I'm going to wake up. And if Mark is in Crystal are telling the truth, I'm going to have a pad and a paper. I'm going to have to turn on a light because the idea is going to come through and it's going to be like a wet, slippery fish. So I got to grab it and hold on to it. And, and it'll tell you. And like when we're writing books right now, still, we're in the deep of a, a giant. It'll be another big book for us. And it, it is illuminating to tell you the truth. But it, the illuminations come through and they don't come through. In a holding pattern, we'll all wake up tomorrow morning and remember, because you don't remember, so you've got to do it the way I said to do it. Ask yourself, what's God's destiny for me? And most people then will be happy, whole, and complete. And let me do the downside is 87% of people, according to Time Magazine's research, are unhappy in their occupational job. Mm -hmm. Well, I trained to be an engineer. I trained to be a medical doctor. God bless you. That's what you do. That's not who you are. And what we're saying in this book is you're a human becoming that transcends your human being. And, and it, it can only get there through physical, mental, and spiritual work. You start your book out with this beautiful fable. I really enjoyed it. It was like watching a movie as I was reading. And I was curious, is that something that you adapted from something else or did you write it from scratch? Certainly it sets so, up the book, right? Yes, yes. It's funny, Debbie, because, and I'm so glad you asked because I love the fable. We both love the fable too. Um, so Mark and I decided we, we love fables. We love stories because it's, it's an opportunity to teach. We learn so quickly through stories, right? Because human beings, uh, stories all contain patterns and we learn, our brains learn in patterns. So it's just a very easy way to understand uh, a concept or a principle to tell a story, especially with emotion. So, um, because that, that locks that into your memory. So we decided to write this fable. And at first we were talking about animals. And then I said, you know, why don't we write it about a girl? So I took, you know, a lot of times we'll pass our writing back and forth when we're writing together. But I just took off with this fable and it was like, it was an amazing experience for me. I, I wrote the entire thing without stopping over a couple of days. And 
when I handed it to Mark, he started crying and he goes, we had originally thought that we would maybe cut the fable up into four parts. So they it's interspersed throughout the book. And he said, honey, this is so magical. We have to start the book with this because it gets everyone. It sets the mood for the book. And, and I'm so happy we did that. Um, I've been very blessed in my life to have these amazing dreams that guide me. And so I took some of my own dreams and modified them to fit the story of, of Michaela. They're not exactly my dreams, but from some very similar qualities and, and events. So it was really, um, I don't know. I just, it, it's like that, that story lived somewhere. And I, I had the good fortune of being able to just pen it down, but it, but it was living in universe somewhere. It just was there. Even the characters just came to me as I just flow. It was, it was just an amazing experience, truly. Yeah. And it's very fleshed out. And I, I, you know, kudos that that was downloaded through you because you're right. It's not just a couple of pages and, you know, ta-da, this is actually very engrossing. I mean, I, I loved reading it and I really like the arc of Michaela because in the beginning, it's kind of like, oh no, what else could happen? You know, I really, my heart was breaking for her and Mm -hmm. I loved how she received these dreams. The dreams definitely had wisdom and direction. She woke up first thing in the morning and she wrote so she could keep the dream close to her. But then she implemented. And the implementation, you could see her entire life start to shift just by trusting and following, just by doing. Yes. And what's amazing is when you read, we won't give away the whole story, but layer by layer, um, as Michaela follow, follows the admonishment of what she's getting, the messages that she's getting in the dreams, that layer by layer, um, her life expands. And by the end of her story, you don't even recognize her as the same person. Michaela is living a completely different life. And so really, Mark and I look at it as every woman, every man's story, because um, just to give a little bit away, she's she starts off being indent an indentured servant, essentially, at a, at a stone quarry. Her, her daily activity is about lifting heavy rocks from one place to another. And I think for a lot of people who have lost hope, like Michaela, Michaela's lost everything in her life that mattered. So she's lost all hope. And I think for a lot of people, that's how life feels. And so we wanted to start there because we want people to understand that you know, we're inviting you to take this journey with us, this asking journey. And just like Michaela, your entire life, if you say yes to this journey, your entire life can be completely transformed. Hmm. Yeah. And the other thing you said was that you saw it as a movie. It sort of unwrapped. We dream, visualize, and are promoting in our minds that somebody is going to come to us and say, hey, this has got to be a movie. Because it, it, you, you, you see, and then the other thing just is a, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we've had so many people and we've gotten like 120 emails in a day saying, oh my gosh, I read it. It got me. I woke my wife up. Then I woke up my teenagers. I read it to all them and it transformed all of us. And I was, we were all depressed and locked down and now we're feeling open again and have hope. So it's amazing what it's doing. That's incredible. Yeah. So, you know, from your mouth to God's ears, I already see it as a movie myself. I hold that for you both. And we've got the fable and I know there are stories in here. What about the science part of asking, is there neuroscience? Is there epigenetics or quantum physics that are involved that affect our consciousness when we ask? Right. So let me tell you about the science we looked at specifically for asking, because it's really interesting. When we ask ourselves a question, a different part of our brain lights up and it's the part of our brain that does critical thinking. So immediately we, our own brain becomes a better resource to us. The other part, when you take it to a quantum physics level, when we start asking the right question, questions and we start receiving the answers, we're changing who we are. And as we change who we are, we begin to magnetize a different life, right? Because whether we know it or not, we are creating the magnet for what we're getting. We are, we are a magnet and if we're creating, we can be creating um, you know, the negative, sort of a negative basis for all that we're getting or we can create a real positive pull for everything we truly want. And that's what, what happens when you start asking. So in the ask yourself part, 
Debbie, we say there are really like three critical phases to asking. Um, and those are, you know, where am I now? Because so few people take the time to figure that out. They just, life is just, they're just hurling along like an asteroid through space, never sitting down and going, where am I? And, and all the little questions that start to come under that, as you start to ask yourself, it opens your mind to more questions. Do I like what's going on? Is this working? Am I happy in my career? Is this where I want it to be? Am I missing something? All of these things. And then question by question, you, and you'll start to get answers. You'll start to get solutions. You'll start to get illumination. The second critical phase is, where do I want to be? So few people, I mean, most people are afraid to dream. They don't dare to dream for the greatest life. And we say, when you get to that second phase, where do I want to be? Utilize that beautiful imagination that God created you with. We are the only animal with imagination. And if you look at the good book, it says we're created in the creator's image. Well, that is exactly how we create. We create through our imagination. And that's why it was given to us. But the problem is most people are imagining the worst because they're looking at their past and imagining that it, you know all these things are going to pull them down or suck them down and all the worst things are going to happen them, to them based on what might have happened in the past. And so they're really projecting that into the future by doing that, by recirculating all of those programs that, that run through the subconscious levels of our mind. So asking these questions allows us to break out of that. And we say, ask from the nth degree of your greatest success through your imagination. So, and if you're asking about your career, imagine yourself in the career of your dreams. Just take that time with yourself and then start asking the questions from that place. Who am I talking to every day in this perfect career of my dreams? What products and services am I offering? How are people responding? How am I serving? What does that feel like to me? Who am I becoming as this person in this amazing scenario? And, and you can do that with relationships, with your health and fitness, you know, who am I in my most perfect health and fitness? What do I do every day? How do I achieve that? What sort of things am I eating? What am I doing? What are my activities? Anything you want in this life, relationships, health and wellness, um, your career, it works the same way if you ask from that beautiful place in your imagination. And then of course, the third phase of that is what, what steps, what specific action steps do I need to take? to bring these plans into motion because we do live in this physical reality. So we, when we start to get those breakthroughs, those illuminations, those plans, those ideas, we'll start to flow through and you need to be writing them down. But then take those action steps. You thought of that person, go call them, connect with them in some way. You thought of a book or something you'd read, follow through on it. All of those things start to come together. And soon you find yourself moving across that bridge to your destiny. Can you give some examples or example of yourselves or somebody you're coaching or in an audience that you taught specifically how to ask and the evolution that it took them on the arc of their story where they ended up? Well, first of all, I love the question. Thank you for that. And one of we did 26 interviews, one of which was a guy we just met. I'd only met him by telephone and by answering his emails previously, a guy named Jim Stowell. He'd been a superstar football player ready to become in the NFL gets recruited and the doctor comes back and said, look, kid, you're 19, but I'm sorry to tell you, you're going to be permanently, totally, completely and forever blind in six months. So Jim goes home and he's locked in a little nine by 12 room at his family's home with a radio, a television, a telephone and feels trashed and is complaining. And his mommy says, look, Jimmy, you know, you're a giant of a kid. Go down to the blind and see if they've got some solution for you. Well, it's an echo chamber of negativity. But fortuitously, he sits next to another blind woman who is a court stenographer. And he says, you know, I used to love to watch TV and, and now we can't see anything and see if somebody threw a right hook or screeched out. Somebody ought to do something. Well, this lady who became his partner, Kathy, hits him in the ribs and says, asks him, wait a second. Wait, 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 Jim, we're somebody. Why don't we do something? Well, long story <laughs> from press. They now have 14 million blind people paying $10 a month. It's one of the biggest services like netflix or anything in the world and you've never heard of it because you're cited and most people watching and listening to us are cited but they run narrative tv well along comes charlie trans jones who's been one of my close friends we've talked on to ten thousand people on amway together and 
he says, look, Mark, I know you're selling 15 million books a year, but, and you're busy, but you've got to read Jim Stovall's book. And I'd never heard of Jim Stovall. And he says, you got to read it and write the forward to it in an endorsement. I'm, I'm, I've only asked you for one favor my whole life and I've done you a lot of favors. So I said, okay. I read the book and I said to him what you said to us. I see this as a movie. We wrote it on the back. Well, the movie, The Ultimate Gift, made $100 million. And so does this stuff work? Well, we were just in Tulsa talking to 4,000 people just a few weeks back here. Here, I mean, really, in the last couple of days, he invited us out to his club, said, if I live a million years, I'll never be enough to not thank you every day of my life for saying, even though I was blind, you could read what I wrote and you could see it as a movie before I could. And he said, as a result now, I write books I can't read and I make movies I can't watch. So does question asking work? The answer is 100% yes. And yet what, what Chris will talk about, if you want, is the seven roadblocks that stifle, stop, and detour all of us. Seven roadblocks. Um, I can just imagine. I know they're in your book and they're laid out. I know that fear is one of them. And can you go through some of the others so people might recognize themselves? Right. I, I, the big one is unworthiness. I mean, that's the top one because it's just this underlying feeling that so many people live with. And it's usually conditioning of some kind from our childhood that uh, leaves us thinking that we're just not enough. So when opportunities are presented to us, we're standing there, there's that perfect person at some meeting or some dinner or some event, and it's, it's the person you needed to talk to, or, you know, somehow you get close and, and, and you hold back and you go, I'll do it later, or I'm not ready. Or, you know, someone calls you and says, are you ready to do this? You know, we'd like to have you come in and talk to us. And all of a sudden that comes up, you know, and, and you don't, you don't ask for what you want. You don't ask for what you need because deep down you haven't gotten in touch with that unworthiness and it's controlling your life. And, um, you know, there's naivete. I mean, that's a big one. I tell the story in the book about Imelda and the mangoes. And when my daughters were very young, they were born 16 months apart with this beautiful Filipino woman who was coming every day and helping with the children. And she would make these great dishes from her homeland. And um, she cuts up a fruit one day and puts it on a plate and says, Crystal, try this. And I bit into this juicy orange fruit and I go, Melda, what is this? And she goes, it's a mango. And I go, a mango? How come I've never tried a mango? I've been all over Europe. I felt like I was such a worldly person. I thought, how did I miss the mangoes? And I go, where did you get it? Thinking she must have imported it from the, <laughs> from the Philippines. And she goes, at the grocery store. And I'm like, seriously, I've been passing these at the grocery store, the best fruit in the world. But it made me think about it. You know, I'm I'm naive. I'm a girl who grew up from Idaho. We had lots of potatoes, no mangoes. So I'm not looking for mangoes. But what else am I passing by every day? What person that could be like my next, next best friend, best advocate, you know, somebody that I need to help or my next opportunity? I mean, so many of us just walk past or look past some of the things that we should be inquiring about we should be asking about we should be wondering about and and this book is a journey back into the wonder of who we are because we you know we come into this world as these perfect little uncorrupted children we're not afraid to ask we're, we want to know everything we're wildly curious we want to know who what when where why how right and we want we're not afraid to ask for more we're not afraid pretty much to ask for anything Right. But then suddenly, depending on how we were parented, what happened in our school years, um, you know, stop talking. I'm tired of hearing you. Stop asking me so many questions. Sit down. Don't ask any questions unless you're called on, unless I call on you. You know, just basic rejection at work. Your opinions aren't valued. You stop contributing. You stop asking. Suddenly we all get shut down because that beautiful inborn ability to ask gets crushed out of us. And so we find ourselves standing there as an adult, pretty much terrified to ask anyone for anything and um, ashamed that we don't have all the answers. And it's sad because it, this is a journey. This life is a journey. We'll never have all the answers. We need to be able to open up to asking ourselves and asking others because we need to be a part of each other's journey. It's an important part of achieving anyone's destiny. Indeed. Uh I want to say I just discovered dragon fruit, so don't feel so bad. Right. <laughs> I, I never had it before, and it was sitting right in my grocery store, and now I'm in love, right? right. It's right. divine. 
but <clears throat> forgive me, of course, we work from home now. Um, I, I'm really intrigued and I want to say, say something and, and, you know, thank you for that story. That's, you know, really pretty powerful of a story. What is possible when somebody has an idea and inspiration and thankfully this woman was sitting next to him to encourage him to go forward and to make sure he knew, no, you're not alone. I'm right here. You know, asking I think is huge. And I don't know where I came upon the ability. I know I didn't always have it, but I know sometime in my adulthood, something shifted and I got a lot of chutzpah. You know, I got a lot of like um, willingness, chutzpah. Yeah. The Yiddish word of, you know, well, cojones. <laughs> I lived in New York. I know what chutzpah is. I got it. And, uh, you know, it sometimes amazes me. So I'm going to give an example. It amazes me when people don't. So as with most of us who are entrepreneurs, I will have occasionally a call with somebody who's very interested in my services. Now, most people, it works out, it moves forward. But every so often, I'll get somebody and the big deterrent, money, right? Oh, I can't do that. I don't have the money. And before I know it, they're getting off the phone. And I've often sat there and thought, that is really fascinating that you are not standing for yourself because it costs them nothing to ask me a question. And I have options. I could give them at least off the top of my head, five options that probably would work for them, even if they worked with me once every four to six weeks, right? Or they did my online program or, 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 or. You know, a facilitator, there's a million ways that they could come in and still be assisted. And I'm amazed they're, they're getting off the phone, the Zoom, they're done. They've already canceled themselves out. And so I, I loved when I got this book and I love the premise of this book and the heart of this book. And I, so I want to go deeper into this asking and like what really is possible for people who aren't even considering doing these things? How bold can people get around asking? I think there's, I think each of us is intrinsically, once you wake up to your self-awareness, you're unlimited because you're made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, you've got God drops in you. It's like a drop of water in the ocean. The ocean's still the ocean. God's still God. And you and I have that infinite ability. And so let me just do my story, okay? So 1974, I've been in graduate school with, I, I think, one of the smartest, wisest men ever, Buckminster Fuller, Einstein's best guy. 15 doctorates at Harvard, thousands of inventions like geodesic domes, the maxing cars. And I'm trying to be Bucky and make the mistake of doing his stuff. And I'm, I built the Wall Street Racket Club, botanical gardens, aviaries, homes. What I didn't get, because you can't be a good anybody else, is that I was building at the wrong time out of plastic, PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And I crashed and burned so fast. That's where I learned how to ask the wrong question, which is what the people are doing. Right? Not, Debbie, yeah, give me all the options. I mean, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. Back to the unworthy thing is what they're really saying is intrinsically they don't feel their self worth. And that's where I was in 1974. And I checked a book in the library, How to Go Bankrupt by Yourself. <laughs> My best worst experience. So for six months, and I was reading the New York Times, all the worst news fit to print. I'm sleeping in a sleeping bag in front of another guy's room for six months. And I keep saying, okay, God, what is it you want me to do? Otherwise, I'll slash my wrist because I don't get it. Because I thought my self-worth and net worth were the same. Those are not the same. Because we've got people out there hanging on by their fingernails and they're going, yeah, it's easy for you. You're vastly successful. But I, you know, wasn't. And, and so I said, what am I supposed to do? And he said, no, what do you want to do, Mark? And I said, I want to speak to people that care about things that matter that make a life transformative difference. Well, that was miracle number one. Miracle number two, I go down to my roommates. I'm living in Hicksville, Long Island, New York. And I go, Hey guys, you know anyone young speaking that's not a Broadway star, a celebrity, a lawyer, a doctor, a famous person? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my ticket. There's a kid out in Hawthog, a few years older than you, but he is dying. Oh, my. I go second miracle. I go out to Hawthog with his ticket, listen to the guy Chip Collins, mesmerized 500 people, go up to him at the end, and I ask him, I say, Chip, teach me how to do what you're doing. He said, no good chance you make it. It's one in a thousand. You ain't going to make it. So go do some real work. I said, no, no, this is what I want to do. Well, he told me what to do. I started doing it. And then the fourth miracle is people in the audience said, wow, that is a great story. I got to take it to my wife or I got to share it with my business. Do you have it in a book? So I quick did a book called Stand Up, Speak Out and Win. And the little itty bitty audiences, that's what everyone's got to hear. You start small as an acorn and you can become an oak tree, right? I um, 
did this book and I sold 20,000 copies to six people, 10 people, 12 people, little insurance offices in a year, but that at $10 each, 20,000 times $10, $200,000. Again, I, I'm rising. I buy a brand new Chrysler Cordova with Corinthian and other. <laughs> I thought I had arrived for a second time, but that started what is now 318 books, a half billion sold. And my goal is to sell a billion, which if you ask anybody, that's impossible. <laughs> Which is okay, but I'm going to be 127 with options for renewal. I got a high quality life, a great, explosive, white, beautiful, wonderful, wise wife that we're going to live that long. So it's okay. So, uh, first of all, Hicksville, I just want to say I grew up in North Belmore, Long Island. So, you know. yes. So we grew up rather close to each other in New York. And what I really appreciate about what you just said, Mark, is in your ask, so you you got to a bottom, you were completely frustrated and you had an ask, I wanna speak to, this is what it looks like, this is what it feels like. But I think what's really important is you didn't supply the details. You didn't say this is exactly what I'm gonna talk about and this is exactly who's gonna attend and this. You had the energy of it. And I think that takes the onus off of the ask. And so I appreciate that you're sharing your story because for people out there listening, you can too have a, a design-ish of what it might look like. Is that correct? Not only is it correct, I'd like you to let Crystal tell her similar story because Please. every one of us starts general. My teacher, Bucky Flores, said go from macro to micro, big to little, deductive to inductive. And most of us say, well, if I don't know every step, then Debbie, I can't do it. Well, no one knows every step. You can't. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you just do the next right thing and then it more will be revealed. Crystal, when you tell your story, I'm so grateful we're coming to you next because that was my direction. Mark and I, Hicksville, <laughs> North Belmore are on the same page here. <laughs> and I want to just say, because you talk a lot about fitness and uh, being spiritually, emotionally, physically fit, being healthy. And added to your story, will you also include, was there an awakening with your body that allowed that wisdom to come through you in order to disseminate that to those who need to hear it? Yes, I will. And that comes a little bit later, Debbie. But so I was one of those kids that uh, found high school to be really easy and boring. And uh, so I accelerated my curriculum, graduated um, at age 16 and married my boyfriend who was five years older. Not a great life plan, as it turns out. <laughs> Two and a half years later, I'm in a new city, um, no family, no friends, divorced, baby on my hip, and honestly, no idea of how I was going to support myself. It was really scary. It was a scary time. So I applied for food stamps because I'd heard about that. I'm like, what should I do? And the day, the first day I was standing there, the, the food stamps arrived. I go to the grocery store. I'm standing there getting ready to turn those over for my food and diapers. And I suddenly had this epiphany that I will never forget because it felt to me like a light suddenly was shining on my head, revealing something to me. But this question dropped into my mind, like, how did I get here? Followed by a second question that was very revealing. And it said to me, I heard this in my brain, are you doing the best you can or are you taking the easy way out? And I, the second I asked myself that question, I knew the answer. I knew that I wasn't doing the best I could. And honestly, I didn't even know what that was. I really did not know what this, that was, but I knew I, there was something more inside of me. I knew there had to be something more. So I went back to my apartment um, where I was getting eviction notices every single month. And um, I just started asking questions because like, I didn't have any answers, but I knew I had questions suddenly. So I was asking myself, who would hire me? What skills do I have? You know, How can I make money tomorrow? And as I'm asking that question, I remember hearing on the radio, like Kelly girls, you know, Kelly services, sign up for temporary work. You can get work tomorrow. So I call them. I apply, I fill out the paperwork. They start sending me jobs. Then I apply for, I fill out paperwork for two more temporary agencies. So they're all sending me jobs and I'm, you know, working every day. Some assignments would last four days, some four weeks. I'm filling in at attorney's offices, selling at conventions, um, setting up booths at malls, doing all these different things. And I began to learn a lot about myself. I really learned that I love small business. I was fascinated with small business owners that they could just, you know, start a business and like go for it. I love that. And I was so intrigued. And then I also love sales. So I decided to put myself through real estate school. 
So in the meantime, someone approached me and asked me um, if I did any modeling and told me I should do it. So I thought, what do I have to lose at this point? So I went into the biggest agency in my valley, the talent agency, and asked them if they would sign me as a talent. After stumbling through some lines that I had to read and down the runway, you know, acting like I knew what I was doing. Fortunately, they signed me. And so about a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half from that moment that I turned over those food stamps to the cashier, I'm now a licensed realtor working for the biggest home builder in my valley. I became the number one realtor and I happened to do some television commercials that went national. So at that point, when you get enough residual income, they make you join Screen Actors Guild, which allowed me to get the best insurance benefits available, you know, for myself and my little boy. And I have to tell you, I, I knew that was a life pivot for me. And I often look back on that moment because I knew it would have been just as easy for me to go, like slide into my victimization and just keep going the wrong direction. But I'm so thankful for the question. That question changed everything for me. Are you doing the best you can? Are you taking the easy way out? It was like my moment of truth. I knew there was more. And so I think part of that is being able to answer yourself with a lot of courage and honesty. I think that's really important when those moments come to us. You know, are we going to face it with courage? Are we going to answer our own questions with courage and really sort of parent ourselves in a way? You parlayed this into health and fitness down the road? Right. So um, my mom was really ahead of her time. Um, yeah, so I got into real estate, sold a lot of real estate, started investing in my own stuff. And then I became fascinated because I would be selling a house to someone and they would start talking to me about all their issues and problems. Before you know it, I'd be writing a plan. I would tell them what to do and they'd say, can you write that down for me? I don't know how to say those words to my husband or I don't know, <laughs> you know. So I thought I've got to do something about this. I thought I'd go back into psychology. I took some classes and I'm like, this isn't it. So um one of the guys building my cabin, it's sort of a long story, but he came in one day and he was so fit and slim. And I said, Tony, what happened to you? You know, the last time I saw you, you were a lot bigger. And he said, I, I stopped smoking and I got hypnotized. And I said, wait, that doesn't work that way. You're supposed to gain weight. He said, I know it's, it's miraculous. The guy gave me an audio, um, listen to it for 30 days. I can go sit in a bar with my friends. They're smoking. I don't crave food. I don't crave cigarettes. And I'm like, I was hooked, Debbie. I, I researched the best holistic school and signed up. And I ended up taking, immersing myself in all of the certification courses for life coaching, for clinical hypnotherapy, started doing the clinical. I started having so many breakthroughs. Um, and part of what I was coaching people on was health and fitness. Um, because I had been fortunate enough to grow up with a mother who was very much into, um, you know, big organic gardening. We do, we, you know, all this kind of stuff. It was, it was before it was chic. She was having us do juice cleanses and eat all organic vegetables from the garden. Um, but, you know, there was a point in my life where I, I realized that I wasn't just loving myself the way I knew I needed to. I remember racing back one day after I'd eaten like a caramel muffin, you know, and going back to my scales, like if I gained any weight, it was sort of this obsession with being perfect and making sure that I was this particular weight all the time. And as I'm going back there, I had another one of those epiphanies. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know what it takes to have health and fitness. You know what to do. You know what, what your body loves and what doesn't love your body. So why don't you just start trusting that? And from those questions, I started forming that program called Skinny Life, the secret to physical, emotional, and spiritual fitness, because I had seen it in my clients. It's so much more about learning to love yourself and then make it your business to understand what are those, what are those things that the foods that love me back. I say in my Skinny Life program, I want you to love food more than ever. I just want you to love the food that loves you back and make it your business to know what that is. And so that's how I got into that space is because, you know, a lot of my clients needed help for weight loss and they would, they, it was, they all would, you know, save their fat clothes and go on this roller coaster. This it's more of a merry-go-round, the weight loss mm -hmm. merry-go-round where they lose weight and come back again and, you know, gain it all back. And I thought, this is crazy. 
This yeah. does not have to happen. I call it being an accordion, right? So when people yeah. go out That's and come back in and go out and it's like, oof, so rough. And I, yeah, I, I fully understand. Good on you. I love that we have a hypnotherapist in the house because she's going to hypnotize you to ask questions, ask more questions. That's right. And what happened that led you both to focusing on cleaning up the planet and renewable and natural energy? Because I know you both run two companies. Can you talk about that? When I was in grad school, Bucky Flores said, look, we got to make the world work for 100% of humanity. And oversimplified energy creates water, water, food, food abundance. And that can make the planet work. Not that we don't have a lot of wackadoos out on the planet right now, but we do. And um, but we could do that. And four billion people don't have clean water, don't have energy, don't have food. So all of a sudden, I'm you know I'm doing a chicken soup series, and I'm doing a book with the Wyland, world's most profitable artist, 87 million a year. And we're doing a book called Chicken Soup of the Ocean Lover Soul. And he said, come down and talk to the biggest group down in Florida. And he said, I've got all my artists there. I mean, you've been to a Wyland gallery. I'm sure the guy yes. does the main art. And, and we painted 10 miles of the Great Wall of China during the Olympics. And, and we've just done great things together. And we dive around the world. So he, he is a very, very close friend of ours. So uh, why said, you got to come. And I, I meet this guy, John Petrie, who's a top surrealist artist in the world. If you go to John Petrie, artwork could be blown away. But Petrie <laughs> said, hey, I understand you're really into alternative energy. I'm really an extraordinary inventor well, look at these videos i looked at the videos and he's got you know everything to solve we got pop-up windmills that go 360 degrees for urban wind called a wind charger we put the most money in the company we own the company naturalpowerconcepts.com anyone watching ought to go and watch our videos i'll be blown away we got the way to create more than enough water for everybody because right now california as we talk is on fire because they lack water that's what no one's saying and it just you know, it's neat that we got the solution, but, you know, getting out of inertia is a tough thing for big business because they're saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. No, no, that, that's why you got to ask more questions is what we're teaching. Right. So we have this great company. We've got people making all of our stuff now, and it's, uh, but it's taken 12 years from zero to hero. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And they can find this on your website? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And Terrific. we love it. We just, you know, I want to... I want everyone to be housed, fed, read. I'd like them to read your books, my books, our books, listen to all of our audios, watch our videos. Just, it, just get involved. Everyone can evolve right now. Yeah. And today we have the technology that can make everyone 100% successful for the first time in history. And diving, you mentioned scuba diving? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty good at it. I'm a recovery team diver since I was 16 years old. That's, I'm 73, so that's a pretty <laughs> long time. Wow, Where, favorite place thus far in the world? Two, actually, Jacques Cousteau liked, we've got friends that live down in Isla Mujeres off of Cancun, and, and uh, if you haven't been diving, have you been to Cancun? No, I've been to Cancun, I've never dove there. Okay, well, right off the shore is Isla Mujeres, which is a place that Jacques Cousteau himself lived because it was the best diving in the world, and that's part of, that's the top of the barrier reef. Uh, from Belize up to Cancun. So it's, you need to, if you are a diver, I'm sure, right? Or school. You know, my partner diver. is, he loves, yeah, it's one of his favorite things to do. So I'm sure that's around the corner for me. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so Crystal, you are as well? I don't dive. I love snorkeling. I, I ah. will learn to dive eventually. I just haven't done it. Um, I, I'm a little claustrophobic. So going down that far, but I love snorkeling. I mean, we love snorkeling mm -hmm. off, you know, St. John's Antigua. I mean, so many beautiful places to snorkel in the world. I find that I'm very content mm -hmm. snorkeling. That's <laughs> beautiful. I've been as well. Yeah, it's, a, it's great. I mean, it's a whole nother world when you stick your being into that water. It is. It's, it's so wonderful. And what about, you know, one of your books I found interesting was The Miracle of Tithing. And I know that's not really the... The subject du jour, but there is an ask in there, right? In the sense that there is a, a nonprofit or there's a company or a person or a situation that does have a really big ask attached to it, whether they're speaking up or not. And by giving, gifting, the miracle of tithing, something beautiful happens. Can you talk about why is tithing such an amazing principle? Absolutely. Well, first of all, the three things, if you know, we're made in the creator's image, Genesis 128, then 
you know, it, you're supposed to do three things, create, which is what we've been doing on this seminar or, or Zoomcast. Number two, you're supposed to contribute. And then number three, you're supposed to be charitable. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I think I sell more books than anybody is because we tithe on every book that we're doing. Now, tithing has four basic T's and a fifth bonus T. First of all, you got to tithe their thinking, which is what every major charity, every major philanthropy, they go after just your money. This number four, the treasures. If they went after your mind, to come up with new ideas to raise money, people would come up with wonderful ideas. And I'll just give you an example in a second. So you're thinking, your time, your talent, and then your treasures. And then when you are able to give, because you've come out of shortage and gotten into surplus, which will happen if you become a giver, then you gotta have a thankful heart that you could do all that. And the best example I can give is that um, Liddy Dole came to me and she was head of the American Red Cross or out of blood. And she said, hey, look, people die because we don't have pseudo blood. Yeah. And you got the best ideas, Mark, I've ever heard. Can you come up with an idea on how to get enough blood? I said, yeah, well, let's go to medical doctors. They see blood and guts every day. She said, no, 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 I tried that. There are 570,000 of them. They won't give. They won't score for us. So uh, come up with a new idea. I said, well, look, I work for marketplaces, one of which is the chiropractors. There are 77,000. They see 25 million patients a month. I've taught them how to build big practices. Let me call them and write them and text them. And we did. And we said, call 800 Give Life, bring out the blood mobile. We got a year and a half worth of cryogenically frozen blood because we got people to give. And we did our little book, Chicken Soup for the uh, Third Helping of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And it went wild for the next 58 weeks. But we got the blood. Nobody dies because of lack of blood in America now because I created enough blood. And, it, and everybody that's out there ought to give blood if they can, if they're healthy and happy. And, and a lot of good things happen. Number one, though, that everybody needs to know because you're asking her about health. When you give blood, you get new blood and new blood makes you feel younger. So it's a good idea to give a pint of blood on a fairly regular basis up to 58, every 58 weeks, you can give blood, a pint of blood again. Interesting. Okay. And for people, powerful story. I, get, I give blood myself. I think it's a terrific idea. I know people give bone marrow. I mean, there's a lot of ways to give. For people who are sitting on the desire, right? They're saying, you know, I really, really do want to give, but I'm not quite sure where to give. Some of my books, for instance, I did a dog anthology. Um, it, it won a bunch of awards. It was wonderful. And that was abundantly clear. Oh, I want to give to an animal organization that absolutely helps and rescues and gives a thriving life to dogs in particular. So that felt like a beautiful channel. But for somebody who doesn't see the alignment, how do they know, how can, where can they start about where to give, like where it really feels good for them to give? Right, well, I think you should start where, just what you said, Debbie, like what are the things that call to your heart? You know, is it children? We happen to be, you know, just, we love our children. We're advocates of children. Children need help. They need advocates. They can't advocate for themselves. So one of our big charities is childhelp.org. They've gotten like help 10 million people abused children. So I think you you need to look at what really calls to your heart. Um, are you concerned about the environment? Are you concerned about saving, you know, the wildlife? All of these things that are such good causes. Um, and then once you kind of, you know, understand the things or figure out the things by asking yourself, what really calls to my heart, if I could make a difference, then investigate the, the uh, organizations because some are better than others. You can go to Charity Navigator and you can actually see financials. You know, you wanna give to a charity where most of the money, very little is going to admin. Um, you know, I would say no more than um, 15%. So 85% should go to the programs. That's an important one to check out. Mm -hmm. And the example there is that we're, we won the Horatio Algier Award, yeah. which means we came from rags to riches and been excessively philanthropic. And this year we got 25,000 at-risk kids going to college because of yeah. us and our peers. 10 of us win it in the Supreme Court a year. You get a gold medal. You can go look up Horatio Algier Association. You can see our scholars. You can see the recipients. You know all the recipients. But we spend a week together basically a year, a few days less than that. And, and every one of the recipients contributes something, whether the Rich Carlton gives the hotel room in that, and then we win in the Supreme Court. But all the money we raise goes directly to the scholarships to the kids. And then each one of us is a mentor to a mentee. Yeah. To, and I can just give you story after story, but just in a sentence, this kid comes out of Vietnam that, that his family's had nothing but trouble. Long story, very short, creates a company by asking, coming to our seminars, learns how to ask, and now 
you know, right after he graduates head of his class at uh, USC, he becomes, by asking us how to do it, he uh, created a, a $5 million a year gross business uh, called Instrumental Savings, uh, Nathan Wynn, who's our great, beyond great friend. I mean, you watch these kids grow and bloom and, and you know, he had no father for a while and all that. And, and it just, it's so nice that we're able to do that, but everybody to have a full life, you've got to contribute to somebody else because we're all here to source and serve somebody that can't do it for themselves without your help. Mm. So I hear you saying ask, but also follow the ask. So when you can give, you also give to the ask. Right. And then make sure that, that you follow up, make sure where your money, your heart, your thinking goes, gets the result. And I can tell you that Horatio Kids are some of the more extraordinary human beings. And as a result, we started Horatio Canada and now we're doing it in other parts of the world. But it was started by my old minister in New York, Norman Vincent Peale. So, but that was 70 years ago. So it's amazing what's happened because he asked those who are making it to succeed. And I never, and you never know if you're going to win. I mean, when they called me up, I thought, you got to be kidding. At six o'clock in the morning, you're waking up everybody <laughs> in the family. And I won. You, you're nominated. You, no one tells you, hey, you are nominated to be in the ratio. It's a surprise. Congratulations. That's beautiful. Well, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? And Crystal, I will start with you. You know, I really, we love, we would love to get into filmmaking and starting with the fable of Michaela. So we've had, you know, some conversations with some people from Hollywood, some really great folks. So uh, a couple of producers out there. Um, this other book that I don't know if we can really talk about it yet. This, yeah, this one that we're writing um, for, a, a, he's actually a pastor, a very uh, famous black pastor who is now passed on to the other side, but his family asked us to write his book. Um, and it's called Wishes to, From Wishes to Riches, the, the, Rever the uh, Illuminations of Reverend Dyke. So it's such a beautiful story and such, a, such an amazing story this man's life and his journey that we feel so strongly like that needs to be in, in, made into a movie. And we feel like we've touched, we've been able to touch so many lives through books. And, and we also love the medium of film. And uh, we just want to keep going with that. Great. I see it for you. And Mark, what are you next here to dream? I'll just agree with everything she just said. <laughs> Only say that, you know, at a macro level, if I can help make the world work for 100% of humanity with my thinking, my ideas, my books, my videos, my movies, documentaries, that's what's going to happen. And, and we're owning it. So it's got to come to pass because that's what you and I teach and it works. Mm -hmm. Well, again, their website, markvictorhansen.com. It's H-A-N-S-E-N.com, as well as crystalvisionlife.com. What would you like to say to here? What would you like to say here to the people, to the listeners, to the viewers about asking? What would you like to inspire them to do? Right. I just want to remind everyone um, that there is no mechanism that has the ability to reveal what is hidden from you, like asking. So we just want to invite everybody to take that asking journey with us, because when you become a master asker in your own life, everything changes for the better, I promise you. Um, and we want to invite everybody to a, a free event that we're having. It's um, if you go to askthebookclub.com. We're going to be holding a free, you know, book club discussion class on the book. So once you get your book, um, it's on in every form, of course, Audible, Kindle, um, you know, it's at all the bookstores and of course on Amazon. But join us for that, for that class, because it's going to be really dynamic. We're super excited about that. Askthebookclub.com. And Mark, what would you like to say to folks here at the end? Just that I have a thankful heart that everyone's going to learn the how to be a master asker and they're going to fulfill their life at every one of the multiple dimensions because I think most people only half ask back to what you were really saying, you know, at the very beginning of the show is that most people aren't willing to do their potential and they say, oh, no, 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 I can't afford that. And what they're doing is they're shutting down their own good because yeah. I couldn't, there's no way I could be the world's best selling author because from first grade to sixth grade, I was in remedial reading because my parents were Danish immigrants. So, you know, we didn't have books around the house. So to think that I, I could do that is outside the realm of possibility. But if you top break the lid off by learning how to ASK to GET, which you want, and back to what you're saying, one of the authors in our book who, you know, uh, Rita Davenport says, you've got to get your ask 
in gear. <laughs> right on. Right on. That's beautiful. Get your ask in gear and become, and I love the other from Crystal, a master asker. That is profound. If you guys remember anything, do that. Play around with this concept and let us know what happens for you and from you. Thank you both so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Debbie. We have had so much fun with you. You are wonderful. Thanks mm -hmm. for all you do. Yeah, I appreciate you both so much. And what a great message. I end with this quote from Mark and from Crystal. Everything we learn with emotion creates a much stronger memory in our minds and our bodies. It's the quantity of service plus the quality with a positive mental attitude that equals where you're feeling good about yourself and equals unlimited compensation. Join me next week on this number one transformation conversation. Scarlett Raven is back for the third time, a listener fan favorite. She's an intuitive guide and a powerful entrepreneur, and she has a new book out and new information about Star Sea Channel, and she'll be sharing wisdom and healing suggestions. If you love the podcast and you want to see me and the amazing guests, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, it's D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R and watch the show. And thank you for joining us on Dare to Dream. Remember, don't just dare to dream. Remember to turn all your dreams, ask, so you can turn them into your reality.